from the archives of the greatest dramas in radio history, we proudly present Hollywood. The Radio Theater, starring Jane Wyman, Vincent Price, and Virginia Bruce in Devotion. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. You have read their books and poetry. You have seen their novels made into great motion pictures for the screen. And tonight, you meet them on our stage. The incomparable Bronte sisters, two of literature's most colorful and gifted writers. Born to a family of geniuses, their sheltered life is fraught with drama and romance, so vividly presented in tonight's play, from the Warner Brothers hit, Devotion. Our stars are Jane Wyman, making her first Lux Radio Theater appearance in the role of Emily, Virginia Bruce as her sister Charlotte, and Vincent Price as the man both sisters loved. The Brontes lived in Yorkshire, England, in the 19th century, not far from my ancestral town of Keeley, well, pronounced in England, Keithley, although how they made Keithley out of K-E-I-G-H-L-E-Y, I'll never know. But that is my sole affiliation with the Brontes, other than the privilege of presenting their story on our stage tonight. Here's the first act of devotion, starring Jane Wyman as Emily Bronte, Vincent Price as Nichols, and Virginia Bruce as Charlotte. It's a late afternoon in the year 1836. Around a little rocky knoll set in the bleak, barren moors of Yorkshire are gathered the three Bronte sisters and their brother, Branwell. In Branwell's unsteady hand is a palette and paintbrush. How can I possibly paint your portrait, Anne, if you insist on squirming so? You may be a great painter, Branwell. You're also a great bully. Be quiet, Charlotte. Anne, you have a very pretty nose. Thank you. But completely devoid of character. She has a great deal more character than you. If you think that taking positions as governesses in an attempt to keep the wolf from the Bronte door denotes character... Anne and I have good reasons for taking employment. Have we not, Anne? Yes. We wish to see life. Why? So that we may write of what we see. <laughs> when will you discover that Emily and I have more talent in our little fingers than ever will exist in that busy, noble brain of yours? Tell her, Emily. Emily? Tell her what? Do you want to see the world? Or are you content to stay at home and rot with me? All the world I want to see is about me now. This is my world. You stop painting, Branwell. I'm no longer in the mood. You're never in the mood to finish what you begin. You see, Emily? Already, dear Charlotte, speaks like a governess. Branwell, have you the least idea why Charlotte and Anne are going to work? No, and I don't care. I'm off to the tavern. Branwell. Take my things home, will you? No. I'll bring them, Branwell. <laughs> Good old Emily. Oh, our poor brother. Our poor dear genius of a brother, if he only had the chance. He's a great poet, Emily. A great painter, too. I sometimes wonder, Emily, if you really understand him. The trouble is I understand Branwell only too well. Nevertheless, Charlotte and I shall see that he gets to the Royal Academy in London. No sacrifice that enables Branwell to develop his great talent will be in vain. He could leave with us tomorrow, Charlotte. Travel part of the way together. At least we'd get him safely past the tavern. That's most important, don't you think so, Emily? I don't agree with your plan any more than Branwell will appreciate the sacrifice you're making. Very well. Branwell shall not go to London because Emily refuses to help him. Oh, I'm sorry. Charlotte, I know how deeply fond you are of Branwell. But I cannot understand your attitude, Emily. Branwell isn't ready for London. What nonsense. He isn't a child. I'm not going to argue with you, Charlotte. I, I think it would kill him. Come, we'd better get home. <laughs> Mr. Hodge, where is it? Where's your money, Mr. Bronte? Well, charge it to my account. You've no account here anymore, my lad. I should hope not. My account's with posterity. I beg your pardon. Innkeeper, yes. I should like a room for the night. Well, perish my eyes. It's the new curate. That's right, sir. Nichols. Arthur Nichols. Oh. Yeah, that boy? It's the new curate. Oh. How do you do? You have the honor, do do? sir, of addressing your vicar's son, Branwell Bronte. Well, what shall it be? For me? A bed, Mr. Bronte. I'm tired. And you shall have it. 
Come along. I'll take you to the victory. Thank you, but I'd better delay my meeting with your father till morning. No, who cares? Where's my brandy? On the other hand, I'd better take you home right now. I'm drunk. Exactly. Come on, then. Take me home. My father detests curates. My sisters are sickly and man-haters. I am sickly and a drunkard. <laughs> you should be very happy here, Mr. Nichols. Very happy. Can't you sleep, Charlotte? What's the matter? Oh, Emily, we quarreled this afternoon, Charlotte. Emily, you and I, we must never drift apart. That's so important. Yes, Charlotte. People will always quarrel over Branwell, and Branwell will always enjoy it. But it would be so dreadful if we were happy and he were not. That's why I wanted him to go to London, Emily. But don't you see? London is not the dream city of his imagination. His disillusion would be unbearable to witness. If you would spare him disillusion, it's you who will destroy Branwell, not I. Neither of us will destroy him. He shall go, Charlotte. Oh, thank you, Emily. I knew you'd see reason. I was... The door. There's someone downstairs at the door. Oh, it's Branwell. Now go to sleep, dear. I'll take care of you. Yes, I'm the door now, Mr. Nichols. Seems to have disappeared. And no light. Your family must have returned. Ah, the faithful Emily. Get inside, Branwell. Come in, dear friend. Come in. I think in his present condition, ma'am, I, I should. His condition? Take care of your own condition. Good night, sir. Are not things difficult enough, Branwell, without you bringing your drunken friends home with you? What's difficult? You know very well what I'm talking about. You're all leaving tomorrow. Charlotte and Anne to become governesses, you to London. I have no intention of going to London. I'm much too ill. I'm going to die. Now, listen to me. At 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, you'll be at breakfast, washed and in good order. You'll thank your sisters for their generous gesture. You'll inform Father and Aunt Elizabeth that you have great confidence in the future. You will, in fact, play the great hero on the eve of battle. A role well within your range, drunk or sober. Emily, have you no faith in me at all? I love you, Branwell. I shall never cease to love you. What is it, Elizabeth? Can't you see I'm trying to compose a sermon? Mr. Arthur Nichols is here, the new curate. Where's Emily? He decided to ride with Bramwell and the girls as far as the moors. Why must she spend half her time on the moors? A morbid, depressing, and bad for her lungs. Mr. Bronte, Mr. Nichols is in the hall. Come in, Mr. Nichols. Oh, thank you, sir. I, I hope I find you well, Mr. Bronte. Of course I'm well. No doubt the bishop, acting on information from my daughter, has pictured me a helpless invalid. Not at all, sir. You are here neither as my wish nor my request. It was my daughter Charlotte who took the liberty of writing to the bishop. I hope I shall give you no cause to regret her action. In any event, we'll have no fancy airs around here, Mr. Nichols. There are some pretty rough customers in this parish who are not to be charmed into a state of grace. Would you care for a pipe? Am I being tested, sir? I've no use for a man without a vice. A small one, preferably. It supports his character. And I dare say the large vices support the church, don't they? Very good, Mr. Nichols. I'm happy to find you possess a sense of humor. Oh, come in, Emily. Did they get off all right? Yes, Papa. This is Mr. Nichols, my new assistant. How do you do? Good morning. Sorry you didn't arrive earlier. You could have met my son. He's off for London to make his place in the world. I've heard talk of all your children, Mr. Bronte. A family of remarkable talents, I'm told. You'd have had lots in common with Branwell, Mr. Nichols. Don't you agree, Emily? I'm sure he would, Papa. A glass of wine, sir? Oh, thank you, but I, I never touch it before sundown. Then you'll be pleased to hear that the sun sets very early in these parts. Emily! I hope they looked after you well at the inn last night, Mr. Nichols. The hospitality of the bull left nothing to be desired, sir. I'm sure you felt at home there immediately, Mr. Nichols. Not immediately, Miss Bronte. I was called to take up my duties as a curate rather sooner than I had expected. Indeed? <laughs> yes. One of your parishioners seemed in sore need of an escort home. I hadn't the heart to refuse him, though it proved a very thankless task. Drunkards like that should be left to find their own way home. Mr. Nichols, I... Yes, Miss Brody? I'm sure you only think it was a thankless task. Drunkards are not the only ones who are tardy with their gratitude. <laughs> I 
I'm afraid I'm failing miserably as a picker of blackberries, Miss Emily. <laughs> Charlotte and I used to fill our pails here. Charlotte again. You do miss your sister, don't you? Oh, her letters. She and Anne must be utterly wretched as governesses. You said they'll be back by Christmas. Seven long weeks yet. Forgive me, I, I talk far too much about my family. But it helps me to know you better. That's ample reward. <laughs> but come along, Mr. Nichols. We haven't had enough berries. I'm not really lazy, you know. But so far, I've seen very few berries to pick. I can't understand it. Last year was a very good season. Why don't we sit down and wait until next season? Oh, you'll never last till then. Last? No curate has ever stayed very long at Howard. It's too quiet and dull, even for... Even for a curate? <laughs> for Miss Emily, here's one curate who's asking for nothing better than to see many a season at Howard. Provided, of course... Yes. ...that you promise to stay and see them with me. I promise. But I also promised quarts of blackberries to Aunt Elizabeth. Come, Mr. Nichols. Here is Emily, Mr. Bronte. Assisting Mr. Nichols with Sunday school. Hmm. May I ask the significance of that grunt, Elizabeth? Emily is full of good works these days. Nichols, Sunday school was over an hour ago. I much prefer walking with you, Miss Emily. These strange, wonderful moors. You like the moors, too? I'm, I'm not certain. You've never brought me this way before, have you? I never bring anyone this way. Not even your brothers or your sisters? Oh, no. They don't like this part of the moor at all. They think it's ugly. There can never be anything ugly about your world, Miss Emily. But I, I do feel somewhat of a trespass. Oh, no. No, you're not. That's why I brought you here. Knowing you is a rare privilege. Look, far in the distance there, on that rise of ground. A house. That is a house, isn't it? Yes. Gaunt, lonely, abandoned. Not quite what dreams are made of, is it? But it's been in my dreams ever since I can remember. So unreal, so awesome looking. It's the place I write about. And even though it is gray and storm-swept and made for hard, unyielding people, the lovely things there are all the lovelier. Someone lives there? Ghosts. Oh, you don't really believe in ghosts. Oh, I've both seen and heard them, Mr. Nichols. And in my dreams, sometimes it... It seems that I stand there. And I watch that house in the silence of the night, and then suddenly I hear a sound that terrifies me. The beating of a horse's hooves coming nearer and nearer... A great black horse and a dark rider. And he thunders down on me and I cannot move. What does he look like? I've never seen his face. Miss Emily. Miss Emily, I can hear them myself. Both feet. What? <laughs> Over there, Mr. Nichols. You see, when I'm with you, my dreadful dream turns out to be only one of our wild moor horses. Oh, thank heaven. <laughs> it's getting late, Mr. Nichols. Yes. Miss Emily, that distant place, that... That house. Does it have a name? I don't know. I call it Wuthering Heights. Home, Father? You say Branwell is home? He is. There, in the study. Branwell. No other greeting for the prodigal. But what brings you home? It seems London has treated Branwell shamefully. Emily, you might have acquainted yourself more fully with the ways of that loveless city before you threw me into its chill embrace. No success without influence. No admission without patronage. No patronage without toadying. You wanted this to happen to me. You and Charlotte and Anne. That's not so, Branwell. One more rival out of the way. One less Bronte to share your future glory. Soon you'll be cutting each other's throats. Branwell. You... Oh, I don't believe what I'm saying. Forget. What shall I do with him, Emily? What shall I do? No use looking to Emily. Oh, come in, dear Auntie. Come in. Thank goodness Charlotte will be home in a few days. She'll think of something. Mr. Bramwell is sleeping, Charlotte. Well, if he's ill, Aunt Elizabeth, we must see him at once. There'll be ample opportunity later. Anne, what are you doing? Writing in my diary. Oh, if Bramble were only well, this would be the happiest day in my life. Whatever else we may or may not be, at least we shall never be governesses again. How many copy books did you feel while you were gone, Charlotte? Six, at least. 
But it would take dozens to properly describe that horrible household. And manage to fill only three. Only because my penmanship is smaller. I assure you, I was every bit as unhappy as Charlotte. I think it's shocking of you both prying into the affairs of your employers. Prying into the lives of others is the art of the novelist, Aunt Elizabeth. Well, what's this? Poetry. The night is darkening around me. The wild wind coldly blows. Give me that, Charlotte. But a tyrant spell has bound me. Charlotte! And I cannot, cannot go. Why, Emily, I think it's beautiful. I don't care what you think. That's please keep your fingers away from my work. Oh, I'm sorry, Emily. Oh, but Charlotte, it's such a lovely plan, Emily. We put all our poems into one big package and send them off to London. Poems by three sisters. Think what a stake would cause if they were published. I would as soon think of publishing my poems oh, as... Oh, will you girls stop prattling about poetry and novels? I have some really exciting news. What news? Lady Thornton has invited you all to the Christmas ball. Oh, how wonderful. All the eligible young men of the county will be there. But bear in mind, young ladies, you'll never get a husband talking of poetry. It's very kind of you to drive us to Thornton House, Mr. Nichols. You're quite welcome. But you will please turn around and go back to the village at once. What for, Miss Charlotte? For our brother, for Branwell. Have you not seen enough of Branwell for one evening, Miss Charlotte? Drunk and brawling in front of the tavern? He may be hurt. A few bruises on that wild head won't come amiss. You will do as I say, Mr. Nichols. I'm afraid I must decline. Branwell's in no condition to squire you girls to Thornton House. I order you to turn around instantly. At this very moment, Branwell may be lying dead in the gutter. At this very moment, I don't care. Good heavens. Emily, what are we going to do? Go to Thornton House, Charlotte, dear, and try to enjoy ourselves. Excuse me, Miss Emily. I, I must pay my respects to Lady Thornton. Will you dance with me later? As often as you wish, Mr. Nichols. Thank you. Wait. Yes? Please don't be angry with Charlotte. She doesn't mean half of what she says. You discover that when you know her better. I'm not angry, Miss Emily. And don't worry about Branwell. He can take care of himself. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols, I should like you to dance with me. Oh, with pleasure, Miss Charlotte. My request is not prompted by the slightest desire to dance with you. I wish merely to talk. Well, in that case, may I suggest the conservative? This way, Miss Charlotte. come straight to the point, Mr. Nichols. Like many people here, I have noticed that you pay very particular attention to my sister Emily. In your absence, your sister and I have become good friends, Miss Charlotte. Yes. And I have every intention of protecting Emily from any humiliation to which her generous nature might lead her. I also have a plan for Emily. A dream very dear to both our hearts. Any obstacle which stands in the way, I shall remove without scruple. Do I make myself clear? May I ask the nature of your plan? As soon as I have accumulated sufficient money, I'm going to take Emily to Belgium. There are a number of schools in Brussels that offer an excellent curriculum in exchange for the teaching of English. An admirable plan. But it surprises me that anything so prosaic should haunt your dream. Is it prosaic to want to escape from this rut in which we've spent all our lives? Is it ignoble to yearn for a world rich in material for the books we shall one day write? Miss Emily has always given me the impression of being very content in her rut. And you? And I? You, I fear, will take your rut with you. Shall we go back inside now, Miss Charlotte? With pleasure. You understand, of course, that you will dance no more with Emily this evening? On the contrary. I'm going to ask her for the next dance. Very well. You came to the vicarage at my request, Miss Nichols. And tomorrow, at my request, you shall leave. Shall I? <laughs> Miss Charlotte, there are two ways of dealing with young ladies of your perverse temperament. One way is this. <gasps> you, you dare. You dare to kiss me. <laughs> Be thankful, Miss Charlotte, that I prefer kissing a woman to beating her. Miss Emily. He's come here, Mr. Nichols Branwell. He's creating a dreadful I'll, scene. I'll see what I can do, Miss Emily. You show me where you fit in the drink, and I'll say the last dance to you. That will be enough, Branwell. I've come for a drink. You've had enough for one night. We're leaving. Take your hands Branwell, off me. Be reasonable. I'll teach you to mollycoddle me. I'll break. Oh. I'm, I'm dreadfully sorry, Lady Thornton. I, I had to do it. 
I'll carry him out to the carriage, Emily. Excuse me, Charlie. If I were a man, Mr. Nichols, you would have to answer for this. A change of sex could hardly make you more unjust than you're being at this moment, Charlotte. Now find Anne. We're going home. <laughs> Lady Thornton's home, Mr. Nichols. I, I'm afraid you'll have to leave Horace, sir. Very well, Mr. Thornton. Just a moment, Father. I'm fully responsible for last night's scandal. Mr. Nichols tried only to spare my sister's further disgrace. Mr. Nichols is not in Horace to protect your sisters. And as for you, I should prefer not to see your face for a long time. Such talk cannot hurt me, Father. I'm already too numbed by the great blows of destiny. The toe of my boot should be your destiny. All right, Nichols. You may stay, but in the future, keep your fist to yourself. You should have cracked his skull. <laughs> you know, Bram, you're not nearly as bad as you imagine. I do not judge myself to be bad at all. I'm much misjudged by my sisters, who I've no doubt have poisoned your mind against me. Ungrateful wretches. Ungrateful? What have you ever done to earn their gratitude? Well, if I had money, I should do a great deal. What? Send them to Brussels, maybe. Emily and Charlotte. Anything that would take their tedious enthusiasms out of this house. You know, Branwell, I've never seen any of your paintings. Would you mind showing them to me? Why? Because I like paintings. Because I wonder how... how good you really are. Because I may wish to buy some. Buy some, eh? Come up to the attic, Mr. Nichols. <laughs> Come in. Miss Emily, you came all the way to the village to call on me. We've not seen much of you these past days, Mr. Nichols. No, I, I imagined my presence at the vicarage would occasion nothing but embarrassment. Charlotte? In part. But you mustn't let her intimidate you. In any case, she's so excited now that our misfortunes at Thornton House are all but forgotten. Branwell has sold some of his paintings, Mr. Nichols. Well, you must offer him my warmest congratulations. And with the money, he's sending Charlotte and me to Brussels. Oh, how splendid of Branwell. Charlotte is delighted. You are not. But, Miss Emily, I, I thought this was your aim, your ambition. Dreams that come true are no longer dreams, Mr. Nichols. But think, Miss Emily, what you might mean. I, I can only think that even now it's not too late. Anne could go in my place. Tell me I need not go, Mr. Nichols. I cannot tell you that, Miss Emily. Forgive me. I... I had no right to ask. Goodbye, Mr. Nichols. Our stars, Jane Wyman, Virginia Bruce, and Vincent Price will return with Act Two of Devotion in a moment. Vincent Price as Mr. Nichols, and Virginia Bruce as Charlotte. With the money Mr. Nichols gave him for his painting, Granville has sent Emily and Charlotte to Brussels to further their education. It's night now, and in their room adjoining the Hagar School, Charlotte opens a letter from home. Father has a cold, Aunt Elizabeth's having eye trouble, and Branwell is behaving as disgracefully as ever. Oh, dear, in the three months we've been here, Emily, I don't believe Anne has sent us one piece of good news. Charlotte, will you tell me something, please? Wait till I finish the letter. Just what is it that's going on between you and Mr. Agar? What's going on? The way you look at him, the way you speak to him. Mr. Agar happens to be the master of the school, Emily. And a great man of great charm. Does he also happen to be a man with whom you imagine yourself in love? Emily... Charlotte, did we once not promise there would never be secrets between us? Well, there are some things which I've thought it better not to tell you. Well, any man would find you most attractive, Charlotte. But and I haven't mentioned this to you before, Emily, because, well, because I was too ashamed. But that night at Thornton House, that insufferable Mr. Nichols tried to kiss me. In fact, he did kiss me. Mr. Nichols? Well, there's no need to look so startled. I assure you I was quite equal to the situation. I... 
I asked you about Mr. Agar. Oh, please, Emily. I do wish to finish Anne's letter. There's a very important-looking postscript that... Emily. Emily, look. They're going to publish two of our poems in the Cornell magazine. Thackeray has read them and asks, who are these brilliant brothers? Thackeray? If Mr. Nichols does you the honor of loving you, why do you always speak so slightingly of him? The honor of loving you? Oh, you must be mad. But our poems, Emily, it started to come true. Oh, I can't wait to tell Mr. Agar. Charlotte, dear, do you mind? I believe I've heard enough of him for one day. Well, it was you who brought up his name. Oh, turn out the lamp, Emily. Let's go to sleep. Charlotte, about Mr. Nichols, is he in love with you? What do you know about love, Emily? I assure you, love is not the tormented thing you're making it in your book. I find your people very strange, Emily. Unreal. When are you going to finish your book? My book. My Jane Eyre. I don't know. I don't want to write now. I'm much too busy living. Or too busy dreaming. Well, whatever it is, it suits me admirably. There are those whom it may not suit so admirably. Good night, Charlotte. Good night, Emily. Why did you insist on seeing me, Emily? A letter from father. Branwell is terribly ill. We'll have to go home at once, Charlotte. Go home? But Branwell is always being ill. And he always recovers. Get your trunk packed. I'll do nothing of the sort. You never liked this place, Emily. You're probably only too glad to leave. But I have no intention of giving up my education here. The sooner you give up the form of education in which you're indulging, the better it will be for everyone, Charlotte. Well, I refuse to sacrifice my career to an hysterical whim of yours. Where are you going? I'm going to Mr. Agar. Charlotte, do you not really love me? But God. And if your brother is ill, of course you must go to him. You wouldn't send me away like this. You wouldn't. I am not sending you away, Charlotte. It only seems wiser that you go. Oh, what a fool you made of me. What a fool. You're glad we're on this ship? Glad to be going home? Yes, I'm glad. I would have told you so before, but I've hated so to admit I've been wrong. Wrong about Mr. Agar, wrong about everything. I may even have been wrong about poor Mr. Nichols. Poor Mr. Nichols. Perhaps he does love me, Emily. What do you think? I think, Charlotte, that, that you've had a severe shock. I also think that you will recover with rapidity that may astonish even yourself. Look, Charlotte. The coast of England. England. Of course you'll recover, Branwell. Another week or so and we'll be racing over the moors just as we used to do. <clears throat> There's no need for that sort of eyewash between us, Emily. I'm glad you're back. Read it to me once again. Read what? That last paragraph of your story. If you wish. But heaven did not seem to be my home, and I broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth. And the angels were so angry that they flung me out into the middle of the heath on top of Wuthering Heights, where I woke, sobbing with joy. 
That's the kind of book I should like to have written. But it's not finished, Branwell. Your Wuthering Heights and Charlotte Jane Eyre. Well, finished or not, one thing is clear as daylight about the two books. You're both in love with the same man. Branwell. I don't get excited. No one save your discerning brother will ever notice it. Charlotte certainly won't. Well, you're not attempting any passionate denials. I've never been able to deceive you, Branwell. You're giving it too much thought, my dear. What are you talking about? That pretty view as you look out the window there. Haworth Church and Haworth Graveyard. You're imagining things, Branwell. All the same, I should lose no time in finishing that masterpiece of yours. I'm sorry you cannot stay for tea, Mr. Nichols. I'm sorry too, Miss Charlotte. I came only to return these chapters of Jane Eyre you lent me. And what is your opinion? It will be a fine book. You mix your words with magic. Thank you. Surely you can spare a moment to see Branwell. Oh, of course. Mr. Nichols, ever since my return, I've done my best to atone for my injustices to you. You've been kindness itself. Then why do you avoid me so? And when you cannot avoid me, you laugh at me. May I say that I see you for what you are, Miss Charlotte? What you are pleases me. And if I attempt to avoid you or laugh at you, that is my feeble defense. But from what do you wish to defend yourself, sir? From liking you too well. I I think I'd better see Branwell now. Here's a visitor for you, Branwell. Hello, Branwell. And Miss Emily. Good afternoon, Mr. Nichols. <laughs> it was good of you to come, Nichols. But I'm not ready for the administrations of the church yet thanks to the attentions inflicted on me by these charming jailers here. Your charming jailers are quite as anxious as you are for your recovery. They, too, would appreciate a little more freedom. The martyr's crown sits most uneasily on that arrogant brow of yours, Charlotte. Then I surrender it willingly to you. I don't think these family exchanges can be much mu- amusement to Mr. Nichols. Oh, I find Branwell's persistent attempts to shock me most diverting. <laughs> you know, I sometimes think you regard my family as a troop of players performing for your benefit. That shows how little you know me. Mm. But beware, lest one day you are called upon to play a part in our wretched story. Wretched story? That's nonsense. Oh, come, Branwell, don't try to make a tragedy out of your little comedy of errors. I see no comedy in the error I suspect you are about to commit. Well, I must be off to my parish meeting next time, Branwell. Don't talk in riddles. I'm a very simple fellow. If you had the least idea of what I was talking about, I doubt if you'd care to come again. Go down with Mr. Nichols, Emily, and get yourself some tea. I'll stay with Branwell. Goodbye. Oh, Emily. Why don't you let Mr. Nichols read your book? Oh, do let him. He's been most kind about mine. I do not choose to. This way, Mr. Nichols. Oh, Branwell. Why are you so ill-disposed toward me? <clears throat> ill-disposed? When you've saved my life? I've what? Certainly. The knowledge that my continued existence irks you immeasurably is the only thing that makes my life worth living. You don't mean that. And no matter what you say, I shall never forget the great sacrifice you made for me. Oh, Charlotte, I'm much too ill to go on playing the role of a hero. I did not send you and Emily to Brussels. Nichols bought my paintings. Bought them on the condition that you and she be sent abroad to further your studies. I see. But contrary to your expectations, Branwell, I now have more reason to be grateful than ever before. Of course, we do have to repay Mr. Nichols, Emily, every penny of it. We can discuss it later. You know, if any proof were needed that he loved me, this is it. Don't you agree? I agreed a long time ago. Yes, you did. You're very clever, Emily. But why doesn't he speak? Why? Charlotte, who's with Branwell? Anne and father. Oh, why must you always get off the subject? Mr. Nichols, good evening. I stopped by to see your father, Miss Emily. There are a couple of books he said I might borrow. Well, father has gone out with Aunt Elizabeth and Anne to the village concert. Please take whatever you wish, Mr. Nichols. Or did you really come to see Charlotte? Am I so feeble a liar? <laughs> no. No, I came to see you, Miss Emily. Charlotte is writing. She's upstairs. I'll call her. I said I came to see you. Oh, Miss Emily, you can't do this. Do what? I met your father in the village. He told me you now plan to turn governess, and I say you can't do it. Mr. Nichols, I've all but finished my book. 
And when it is done, I shall naturally be anxious to secure some sort of position. But you're a poet, a dreamer of great dreams. You can't become a servant. Mm, but I can, quite easily. With the extensive education you saw fit to, to bestow upon me, I imagine I could be almost anything. Oh. Yes, Mr. Nichols. As you must know, reticence is not one of Branwell's strong points. I thought what I did would be for the best. And from your point of view, it most assuredly was. You gave Charlotte what she wanted and got rid of me at the same time. How can you say such things? Because I'm a human being. There can be nothing but truth between you and me, Miss Emily. If the village is too small for the three of us, it is not you who shall go. I've tried. I've tried to stop loving you. I really have tried, Mr. Nichols. Emily! Charlotte, what is it? Branwell, he's not in his room. He's gone. I've looked everywhere. Gone? Emily, what are you doing? I'm going to find him. He can't have gone very far. But, Emily, your coat is torn. Leave it to me, Miss Charlotte. I'll have him home again in a very few minutes. Well, I'm coming, too. Just let me find my coat and Emily. She only hadn't gone out in that thin dress. Branwell. Oh, Branwell. In the gutter as usual, Emily. But the first time I've... Failed to reach the tavern. Usually it's the home journey that's so difficult. Oh, try and get up. Give me your arm, I... Oh, this is a poor finish. Bramble. endure two such great losses within a single week, Mr. Nichols. Branwell's death. And now you choose to leave Harworth. Miss Charlotte, Miss Emily, I don't think I need explain what knowing you both has meant to me. Let me just wish you both the great success you so truly merit. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Nichols. Goodbye, Miss Emily. Goodbye? But why are you leaving us? Because I am not a big enough man to live side by side with greatness. Or am I so small that I can stand by and witness its torment? But I don't understand. One day, one day you will, dear Charlotte. I know nothing, Emily. I understand nothing. And yet I have dared to write 200,000 words about life. <laughs> Three of Devotion, starring Jane Wyman, Vincent Price, and Virginia Bruce, will continue in a moment. Act Three of Devotion, starring Jane Wyman as Emily, Vincent Price as Mr. Nichols, and Virginia Bruce as Charlotte. The month following Branwell's death and Mr. Nichols' departure have brought abundant success to the Bronte sisters. Emily's Wuthering Heights and Charlotte's Jane Eyre have been published with resounding acclaim. But Emily's health has failed rapidly, and she remains in Haworth while Charlotte glows in the adulation of London's most eminent personalities. Among them, Mr. William Makepeace Thackeray. And what place is this, Mr. Thackeray? You've taken me to so many places these past two days. This I... is the celebrated Chester Cheese Inn, Miss Blunt. The Cheshire Cheese, where Samuel Johnson and Mr. Boswell met. Exactly. Oh. Do you realize, young woman, that Jay Bear is causing even more of a stir than my own Vanity Fair? Though I doubt that Vanity Fair required any stirring about. And yet it's strange, is it not? What is strange, sir? That Jay Bear should be so much more successful than Wuthering Heights. Your sister wrote the better book, Miss Bronte. <laughs> if you think to tease me, Mr. Thackeray, you are failing dismally. I enjoy success too much to care how well I merit it. Tell me, why didn't your ingenious sister come to London with you? Oh, she's been very ill. Sickness plagues all the Brontes, Mr. Thackeray. But I doubt if she would have come anyway. She detests crowds. Yes, yes, one gathers that in her book. But oddly enough, I think she's very happy in that strange, lonely world of hers. She never had the slightest desire to meet anyone outside the family, you know. Indeed. Then, uh, if it is not too impertinent a question, how did she come to experience so great and tragic a love? Tragic love? <laughs> Emily's the most loving and lovable person in the world, but... If you're implying that she has experienced a great romantic passion, I can assure you such is not the case. You uh, last read Wuthering Heights. I'm going to make the most terrible confession, Mr. Thackeray. I never have read all of it. 
You should, you know. It's really quite good. I like you, Miss Crompton. I like the way you drink all this in, the admiration of a great city. Just as if you'd been doing it all your life. Well, I've been dreaming it all my life. Tell me, do people always stare at you like this? Even in an evening place? They're staring at you, my dear. Oh. And uh, how does it feel to be a lion? Well, it depends entirely upon the keeper and the food, Mr. Thacker. Well, in that event, I'd better order or something. Waiter, if you continue to be so penetratingly intelligent, you'll never be happy, my child. Never. My brother Branwell always said that to ride in the park with Thackeray would be the height of success. He was quite right, of course. But uh, you are not thinking of the height of anything at the moment. Hmm. I was wondering if you would ever walk with me on the moors of Howard. What's that? Walk? Hmm. Moors were intended to be written about, my dear, not walked on. Miss Charlotte, are you so fearful of not being recognized that you must take a copy of your novel out driving with you? Oh, no. It's for a friend, Mr. Thackeray. Tell me, how far is it to the East End? East End? Mm. Oof. Geographically, about four miles. Socially, over a thousand. You're not suggesting we go there? Oh, I wish to, very much. There's a, a minister I should like to see. Indeed. Miss Charlotte, I have a sincere regard for you as an author, and a deep affection uh, as a friend. But if you imagine I'm going to take you to the East End, a district inhabited exclusively by thieves and cutthroats, then you're... Still, I shall go there. Driver. Yes, sir. Turn around. Drive us to the East End. Very good, sir. Miss Charlotte. Miss Charlotte. I could not be in London, Mr. Nichols, without finding out how you are for uh, What a... What a happy surprise to see you. Now, Mr. Thackeray graciously consented to drive me down here. He's, he's waiting in the carriage. How kind of him. And, um... Uh, I brought you a first edition of my novel. Oh, thank you. I've read it, of course. It is the beautiful work I knew it would be. For Miss Charlotte, so it has all turned out exactly as you planned. Not exactly. You see, Mr. Nichols, I thought I would be happy. And you're not? Mr. Nichols, at our last meeting, you said that I would one day understand. I'm afraid that day has still to dawn. I believed... But then you know what I believed. You believe truly, Miss Charlotte. Well, then tell me. Tell me what is it? What barrier has stood between us for so long? I left Haworth because Emily offered me an affection I, I could not return. Emily? Because I love you, Charlotte. Because I have always loved you. Emily. Oh, no, I know what Mr. Thackeray meant when he asked me when I had last read Wuthering Heights. Excuse me, Mr. Nichols. I... I shouldn't keep Mr. Thackeray waiting. Well, go on in. Charlotte's letter. What else does she have to say about London? She had a brief visit with Mr. Nichols. She found him well. I, I can't read anymore. I'm not with Emily so ill upstairs. She's in good hands. Dr. Barnes is with her. He's been up there a dreadfully long time. Dr. Barnes is a very thorough and painstaking physician. We should only be thankful that Emily has at last consented to see him. But I'm not. If Emily consents to see a doctor, it can mean only one thing. None of that morbid talk, Miss. Proceed with the letter. Yes, Father. I had hoped by this time that Anne and Emily would have been able to join me here. Surely Emily is sufficient. <laughs> I can't go on. I really can't. There, child, don't take on. So. I have no more of this. Emily's wishes are no. I shall write Charlotte at once to come home. I'll see the baggage in the hallway, please. Charlotte, my dear. Well, isn't anyone glad to see you? Oh, how glad we are to see you. Father, Anne, Aunt Elizabeth. I'm home. I'm home. We've not expected you for weeks, dear. You weren't happy in London? Oh, London was very kind, Papa. However, one can have too much of a good thing. Where's Emily? Upstairs, Charlotte. Still can find the bed? Yes. Oh, she'll be so happy you're back. Will she? I wonder. What do you mean? Excuse me, Mr. Bonte. Yes, Dr. Barnes? I wonder if I might have a word with you. Well, certainly, we go to my study. And what is this? What's happened? Oh, Charlotte, she's grown steadily worse since you left. Then you let me stay on in London. But we couldn't help it. She forbade us to see you. You forbade them to tell me. Oh, Emily. Emily, how could you? Hush, dear, hush. Oh, it's so wonderful to see you again. But how could you bear to leave the scenes of your triumph so soon? Don't tell me success is an illusion or I shall be horribly disappointed. No, darling, success is everything I hoped it might be. But there was something missing. 
What? You, my darling. Oh, I don't believe a word of it. But it's very nice to bask in that fatal charm of yours again. And all the most interesting people I met talked incessantly of Wuthering Heights. Zachary's last words were, pay my homage to that genius sister of yours. Bless the old cynic. And the, the publishers say they won't have a moment's peace until your next book is in the printing press. You'll have to wait a dreadfully long time, I'm afraid. Oh, nonsense. Nonsense, now that I'm back to look after you. You'll be up and about in no time. Almost the same words I said to Branwell. Emily. Mr. Nichols. Did you see Mr. Nichols? Oh, yes. Curiosity overcame my pride and I went. He was as pleasant and courteous to me as ever. But I found that my old feeling for him was as dead as though it had never been. Please don't lie to me, Charlotte. Not tonight. I have so little time. You're not to say those things, Emily. You're not to. All our lives, there's been too much left unsaid between us. Loving is the only thing that really matters, Charlotte. It's worthwhile being hurt a bit to find that out. The world has always frightened me just a little. So I'm... I'm not really afraid to leave it now. Oh, sometimes... When I hear the wind blowing through the heather or... Or see the sun go down beyond Wuthering Heights. I think... Perhaps I'd like to stay just a little longer. Oh, but you're not trying, Emily. You can stay. You must stay. Oh, listen to me, my darling. Any good there is in me has come from you. Any courage that I've ever shown has been inspired by you. You're everything that I would wish to be myself. And, and life without you would have no meaning. When he returns, and he will, you find the meaning, Charlotte. A far happier one than I could ever teach you. Oh, She brought me to this spot on the moor, Charlotte. This was the place she loved best of all. Here she will always remain. Even the last words she wrote were for us. This paper. Here. I found it this morning. I linger here, listening to the soft wind breathing across my beloved moor. They must not imagine there is unquiet slumber for a sleeper in this quiet earth. For their love is also here with me. And when he returns, and he will, you'll find the meaning, Charlotte. You were right, dear Emily. I have found the meaning. No. Our stars return for their curtain calls in just a moment. Oh, evening in the theater is complete without a curtain call. And here are tonight's stars back in the spotlight. Jane Wyman, Virginia Bruce, and Vincent Price. <laughs> Jane, we're especially grateful to you for taking over for Idol Lapino as he's ill and giving us such a wonderful performance. Thank you, Bill. I enjoyed doing it. See, this is the first time you and I've worked together since Brother Rapp. Virginia, I understand you've become quite a horse fancier these days. Well, I get a lot of pleasure out of raising and riding horses, Vince. And so does Jane. Oh, you both have the same hobby, eh? Hobby hay is right. <laughs> I spend most of my spare time caring for the horses, but I love it. You have a filly that you're raising, haven't you, Virginia? That's right. Do you know what her fastest time is? Yes. From the barn door to the feed box. <laughs> How about you, Vincent? Do you ride? I owned a horse once, Bill, but I got rid of him. He was too polite. Too polite? Yes. Whenever we came to a ditch, he'd stop and let me go over first. <laughs> I see. A little disconcerting. Disconcerting is right. There I'd be without a horse going 14 miles an hour on an empty stomach. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vince, one of the first rules of horsemanship is to let the horse understand who's the master. Yes, we argued about that for hours. <laughs> How did you come out? 
Well, you know the saying that horses are sure-footed? Indeed, they are sure-footed. But well, this one's aim was perfect. <laughs> Good, Good night. night, and thank you for devotion. <laughs> <laughs>